So first of all, tell me, um, just tell me like the name of your brand and a little bit about it. So the name of my brand is Now in Rio Swim and the background behind the name is that uh, the swimmer really is all about kind of getting people to embrace the Carioca style of living and a Carioca is someone who lives in Rio de Janeiro. I used to live in Rio, my husband is from Rio, and my dog is also from Rio. When I was living in Rio de Janeiro, it was such a magical city. I felt like time really stood still, and it was just the most amazing place to be. And I kind of wanted to encapsulate that feeling in a swimwear piece, because swimwear should be liberating, It's not. it shouldn't be limiting. You should feel free, you should be able to do whatever you want and not be worried about your swimwear. And so that was kind of like the whole idea behind Now in Rio Swim. But at the same time, we wanted to make it sustainable um, because we want to make sure that, you know, we're helping the planet and not hurting the planet. And also that it was produced ethically. So, for example, all of our pieces are made here in Portugal. If we are going to make it anywhere else, we are thinking of maybe like making it in Brazil as well. But it's all like we go to the factories, we meet the people, we make sure we know where things are coming from. And that's super important to us as well. That's great. Yeah, it is super important, and it's good that you guys took that initiative and, and went for it. Okay, so let's, let's rewind to the beginning here. Tell me, what gave you the idea initially? Was there a moment? So I actually, this all started because I was feeling extremely lost in what I was doing in my life. And I was launching like marketing businesses, and I was never following through with anything, and I felt like there was something that was being like misaligned with my life and I needed to understand what it was. And I actually took a seven week self-development course where I started learning a lot about myself and who I am. And they asked a lot of like really deep questions and they asked things like um, for you to understand your wheel of life, um, to understand your values, which values are important. If money wasn't a problem, but you still need to go to work every single day, what would you do? Like these kinds of questions that made you really think. And I started to realize that like the reason why I wasn't following through with anything was because I was feeling like I wasn't being able to create, I wasn't in control and I wanted to do something different. I always wanted to do something physical, like a product, a physical product. And I kind of was like, let's do it. Why not? Let's go for it. And yeah, that's kind of where it came from. And swimwear, because first of all, I love the ocean. And I just had that connection. And also because like swimwear is really limiting, I feel still for women. And as a woman that's, you know, not a size zero, I always struggled with finding swimwear that was cute, that like felt good and that looked good and allowed me to do whatever I wanted to do. So I'm more of an active person. I love surfing, I love supping, I love doing all those things. So I wanna look good and also feel secure. And, and all of that kind of together kind of launched the idea of now in real swim. I love that. And I, I really love the mission behind your brand of, of people, not only the sustainability aspect but, um, or the supporting Brazil aspect, but the, the aspect of making people feel comfortable, able to move, feeling good in their own skin. I think that's great. And I think that the swimwear industry especially has been not super proactive in that area historically, um, especially in, in Brazil. Um, yes. But so, so tell me a little bit more like, this, this kind of UBP around your brand of, of people feeling comfortable, once you started talking to more women about this, what was the reaction? So I think that, yeah, so the first, like the pain point came from me myself. It was what I felt and I felt was lacking. And then I actually started having conversations with people, for, with people that I thought were like my ideal customers. So my ideal customers were usually women that are 30s, 40s, 50s, older, um, and they were kind of voicing the same thing that I was saying, like that, all of the problems that I was having. So it was this idea of support, this coverage issue, this thing of like running around and not thinking that, you know, your top is going to fly off. Um, <laughs> because especially for active women, and I think that um, what is what is in the market right now is very specific. It's for like the tanning. It's the, the small little bikinis for tanning on the beach. But there's nothing really else out there. Or there is, but it's harder to find. And it, there's always something. There's an, a but. Yes, it covers this, but the fabric isn't good. Or yes, it does this, but it's not. like. So I kind of wanted to say like, no, there's going to be no buts in Now in Rio Swim. It's going to check all of your boxes and everything that you want. And so... 
Uh, and this all came from like having conversations with people and also going on Facebook. I did a lot of competitor research at the beginning, so I followed all of my competitors on Instagram and I would follow their stories, I would watch what they're posting, I would see what their comments were, like when people were commenting on their posts, and I kind of absorbed all of that. And that plus Facebook groups, plus talking to people over a period of like seven or eight months, I started to realize what the real pain points were and what we could do to kind of address those pain points. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I think a lot of people, especially, they struggle with this, this part of, of figuring out who their target customer is. Yeah because a lot of people assume they know who it is, and then they launch their brand and they're like, oh shit, <laughs> the, the people who are actually buying the product are, are much, much different. Did you experience that at all? Or, or were you kind of right on the money when you figured out who, who was gonna be your target demographic? So I think it's a little too early for me to really say like exactly, you know, I know who, it, who my target audience is. However, from the people that have purchased my bikinis, from the feedback, from like the people that I've talked to, yeah, I was kind of right on the money. Because I knew that a, a, 20, a 20 year old girl that loves to tan on the beach is not gonna buy my swimwear and they don't. I mean, I had one of the models that actually was, uh, that was modeling for us for now in Rio Swim and she's I think 23 and she loves tanning. And I watch her stories and she's never worn my bikini. And so I sent her a message, I'm like, oh my gosh, cause I gifted them a bikini at the end of the photo shoot as a thank you. And I asked her, I'm like, oh my gosh, did you like the bikini? Cause I never see you wearing it. And she basically said, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. I love it, but I like tanning and the straps are too thick. And so I'm not going to wear it unless I want to go and do something active. And so that was like a very, oh, okay, so I'm right in that sense. Like it's really not for the younger tanning kind of women. It's more for maybe, you know, 30, 40, like I said, 30, 40 year old women that are running, let's say they have kids, or they want to be in the water, jumping in waves, and I think I, I think I nailed it. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Getting feedback like that from actual customers or influencers, models, things like that, is so valuable. Like. Getting honest feedback from people, like, hey, don't worry about hurting my feelings, I just want to know what you genuinely think, uh, can be tricky sometimes. So it's great that you get that kind of feedback. Well, that's the thing, like, I actually went out and asked, and I, every person, because the thing is, when you launch a brand, your your first customers are probably going to be people that you know. They're going to be your friends and your family. And so it's super easy for you to actually reach out to them and talk to them on a very human level, you know, because they will provide you that feedback. And so m most of my customers were, were my friends. And I sent the messages and I said, you know, don't worry about hurting my feelings. Tell me exactly what's wrong. What is an issue? Just let me know. And actually, most of them didn't have anything negative to say, which was uh, which was great. There was some feedback here and there, but nothing like earth shattering. So that was also great to be validated in that sense. <laughs> That's great, yeah. And it's good to have friends who can really be honest with you. At what stage did you do this research? Was it kind of early on before samples or was it after you got samples and? Oh, no, no, like the, the competitor research is the first thing that I did. While I was doing my personal development course, I also kind of already knew what I wanted to do in terms of the direction and, and swimwear. And that's when I really started already the competitor research. I didn't even think of models at the beginning and like the styles that I wanted because I needed to look at what was already out there on the market and what I could do that was a little bit different. And it's also you have to think about like where your market is so my market is european mostly now and so there's a lot of cool things happening in the states and a lot of different models and different styles of bikinis that are not available in europe so you need i took that also in consideration because a lot of people in europe are not going to purchase from an american company um, but the styles that are in the states are not necessarily here so all of this was kind of like me absorbing everything and that's where I started to develop the styles, thinking about colors, um, and but the first thing is always competitor research. <laughs> where did you go for your competitor research? Did you use uh, online reviews? Where, where did you go specifically? So Instagram was my first, my first thing. Um, it was where I found all my competitors. I think it really depends on what like what product you have. So Swimmer is a very Instagram heavy uh, brand, like all the brands are on Instagram. And so it was really easy to find them. I really found, you know, hashtag Swimmer brands, ethical brands, and I kind of, once the algorithm started <laughs> to see that I was interested in that, I was just like, all my feed was Swimmer. <laughs> 
So I got to like, <laughs> so it was easy to find them at one point. And they really targeted uh, like European swimmer brands too, which was really nice. I got to see a lot of that as well. And I mean, that was my primary way of looking at, at what was out there. But then I also went on Facebook and I started asking questions in Facebook groups. And I did also, you know, I looked at their websites as well. When I saw a competitor, I went onto their website and I read the reviews. And I would actually read the positive reviews and also the negative to reviews to see where they might have uh, like missed, miss, like missed a step. Yeah, that's very important. And when we when we teach and mentor our students, we always say, if you're going to look at reviews, it's yeah. best to look between the two to four star reviews, because generally the one and five are very biased or very strongly worded. And the two to four is usually where it was like, it was good, but yeah. to improve it, I would like to see A, B, and C. Yeah. So kind of getting those, those can really be helpful. Did you take any courses? I know you did the personal development one, but did you take any courses on how to build a fashion brand or build a brand beforehand? Or did you just kind of dive right in with the analogy you had? So I did two things. One of the things was that I've actually never built a fashion product before. And fashion is really complicated, which I found out very quickly. Um, and I had no idea where to start. So there are things of like modeling and sampling and, and uh, like technical sheets and all these things, which I had absolutely no clue about at the beginning. And when I started diving into it, I was like, I cannot learn this on my own. Like this is way too hard. And when I started Googling, I actually went and I found this like sustainable innovation program, which is this girl that works with Portuguese brands. And I took a course from her and I kind of, she kind of really helped me in directing me in the right path in terms of manufacturers, in terms of uh, fabrics or what different fabrics are and gave me information about like what a like tech pack is and how to build tech packs and, and all these kinds of things. It was a very basic kind of knowledge, which, but it was a great, program for me in terms of the branding aspect because like building a brand is different than understanding how to like build the product and so for me at the moment i was working for a podcasting company and i was like hey you know what i have all these resources for like free basically so why don't i why don't I start a podcast and let's talk about branding and let's talk about how to build a brand and I can interview branding strategists and we can talk about the basics of building a brand and at the same time I can actually learn how to create a brand. Yeah. <laughs> I like your style. I like the way you think. Yeah. So I, I kind of, and you get to kind of talk to big people in the industry and really kind of pick their brain in terms of how do you build a brand. And I interviewed a lot of really cool people. I learned a lot of things. I still have the biz, uh, the podcast at the moment, and I'm still talking about different aspects of building brands. But it really helped like um, build the foundations and really kind of build up because I have a background in marketing, but marketing and branding are very different things. A lot of people think it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. And your marketing usually is very heavily influenced by your branding. And so I knew how important it was to get the foundations right and how it's like not just a logo, it's so much more and it takes so long to build it. It's ridiculous. Um, it took me like at least seven or eight months and I'm like to get the, the basics done, but it's also an ongoing process, right? So yeah. Right. Yeah, brand, I mean, that's why when we, in our course, we have very, very distinct sections, one for branding and one for marketing. Yeah. And the marketing one is longer, but the branding one does come before that for a very specific reason, is that you have to build that foundation. You have to understand what your brand looks like, feels like, speaks like, so that when you start your marketing, everything is very fluid. Everything works together and people feel like they know your brand like a person, exactly. you know, and, and that's very important. One of the biggest things that, that our, our students struggle with is getting samples, finding suppliers, things like that. So mm -hmm. tell me how the process was for you. Did you get help in that or did you just kind of blast out emails to all the suppliers in Portugal? I blasted out a lot of emails and then I quickly realized that it was hard because there's something called minimum quantity orders and uh, those are very tricky because you as a new designer, a new brand, you don't want to have 100 pieces of the same style and have like 500 bikinis without even understanding if it's going to sell. And a lot of the really great, like really nice manufacturers, they have very high minimum quantity orders. 
They also are very far away. So a lot of them are in Braga, like up north. And one of the things that was really important to me was to be able to go into manufacturers to look and talk to them, to touch my pieces, to see how every, the whole process step by step was going. And that was super important to me because I w was always very involved in the whole process. And so it was it, it became really tricky because the individual that I was working like that was doing that course, she recommended some people, but it was kind of like freelance fashion designers. Like an agent who would work as a go between between you and suppliers? Or? No, that they would do it themselves, kind of oh. they would create all the samples themselves. They were like a fashion designer that just finished school and they also did like sampling and stuff, but and they would send me their portfolios and they were just like not the best. And so I wasn't trusting that process either because I was like, I don't know, like I kind of want s like a space or a manufacturer that kind of has experience in doing this. And all the problem with Portugal, I love this country, but the problem is like also people don't answer. So you'll like send an email and then send like five emails and then try to call them. And then maybe like a month later, they'll answer. You'll be like, hey. And so that was very hard as well. And especially like launching during COVID, my gosh, it was just almost impossible. Hats off to you for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we had to build a list of suppliers and vet a lot of people just to make sure we knew which suppliers were very responsive, which ones answered right away, yeah. you know, because it, it can be a little bit tricky, especially in the summer months, not to mention the COVID yeah. situation. The thing is, once you start, I, I don't want to say stalking because I feel like it's, there's such a negative like connotation to stalking, but I basically was stalking other brands, like swimmer brands on Instagram. And the way that I found my manufacturer was because one of the brands that was located here in Portugal went to their manufacturer as like a behind the scenes and tagged their manufacturer. And I went into there and I was like, oh, interesting. And they were like located outside of Lisbon and they were a swimwear manufacturer. They're only focused on doing like swimwear and a little bit of athletic wear. But I have to say that was also a struggle because I messaged them, never got back to me, messaged them again, never got back to me. And it was a really big struggle to actually get them to talk to me, to respond to me. Even now, like I think one time they disappeared for a week <laughs> and I didn't know where they went. <laughs> it was just, it's a struggle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm happy with my pieces and they're a very good manufacturer, but did I find the perfect manufacturer? No. And it's still like an ongoing process as well. It can be. Yeah. Sometimes people source samples from one manufacturer and then place their order for stock with another one. Yeah. So it really depends on, on who is responsive, but also can meet your needs. If I was going to do it differently, I think that now that I've gone through this whole process, I think that what one of the biggest you know, pieces of advice I would give someone is to do the like, manufacturing of the pieces separate than the development of the, like, the pieces, the samples and stuff. Because what ends up happening with manufacturers is that they don't have you're not the only client. They probably have, I don't know how many clients, hundreds of people trying to do swimwear and they don't have time and they don't have time to actually focus on you. And especially if you're very specific on what kind of t-shirt you want or swimwear piece you want or how you want it cut or how you want this and this, they're not going to give you a hundred percent of their time and they're going to try to rush you through the whole process. And so my manufacturer, like I love them. They're great. They're, you know, they're absolutely amazing, but they have a lot of clients. And I felt like, especially during the sampling process, when I was trying to create my swimwear pieces, they were really rushing me through it. And I am happy with the final pieces, but I wish that I had more time because I'm also the type of person that I want to learn and understand what's going into everything and understand all of the whole, like all of the pieces. And I didn't get the opportunity to do that with, with them. So going forward, I would love to have like a designer that can sit with me, that we can discuss, that we can create like the tech packs and all of the, all of the samples. And then once everything is done, hand it over to a manufacturer and say, here it is, here's the fabric, create this many pieces and we're good. Right. Yeah. And, and that's sometimes the best route. You know, like there, when we work with people, we generally say there's two routes that you can go. One of them is to work with a designer to create tech packs, to understand very all, all the technical details and specifications so that you can send all these materials to a supplier to get samples. But the other way that we've had success with is actually just sending, you know, people research a garment that's as similar as they possibly can find. You know, like something that's almost exactly what their product is supposed to be. 
and then they order that to their house, they, they write down all the specifications of what they want differently, and then they actually just mail that garment to the supplier. And they'll say, like, I, I want this, this, and this to be exactly the same, but I want the color to be this color code, I want this fabric instead, I want the lining to be this color. So like, mm. y you can kind of get them most of the way there with an, a garment that exists, because they can look at the stitching and say, like, okay, we'll have that same style. Etc. Sometimes that doesn't work because I did the same thing. Like I had a uh, like a pair of swimsuit bottoms that had the perfect butt, like the perfect butt coverage, and I literally gave it to my manufacturers. Like, listen, this is exactly the coverage that I want, exactly like this. They never nailed it. We did it like four times, different times, and they never nailed the butt. I'm still not happy with it, and I was very confused because I was like, I literally gave you a piece that is exactly that, like that's exact coverage. How can you not just say like, okay, well do the exact same thing so that's also a, like a huge frustration and I mean another frustration was like they they left out something in the first round and I mean what can you do you kind of had to be like okay next time can you just double check please <laughs> for that exact reason sometimes it is helpful even if you are doing this process of sending an example product mm -hmm. to have somebody on your side who knows mm -hmm. the, the sewing or manufacturing world so they can give you some more specifications to speak the language of the suppliers. Because a lot of suppliers we found work with mainly larger brands. Yeah. So they're cranking out a ton of pieces and they're not ne necessarily working in the details, in the weeds with people about all these, these specifications. Right now I'm trying to uh, work with different fashion designers or I'm trying to find a fashion designer because I really, really want to redo some of the butts of the pieces. And I also want to look at different fabrics um, different colors, what colors can go together, and I want to create a different model, um, a, a new swimsuit piece. And so for me, like I would never ever do it again with a manufacturer. So that's like one of the things that I've learned. I will give them everything so that they can create it. They do absolutely amazing work, but the nitty gritty of it, I need to do it with like a designer or someone that can help me with it. Yeah, and, and I think that's a smart move. Um, and especially when you're branching out, you're thinking about new products, new styles, new cuts, everything like that. Mm -hmm. we, we have entrepreneur friends who will run ads to literally just CAD designs, just to, to test the market, to see what people like before they even produce samples. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways to do it, but um, I think working with a designer either way is really helpful in that sense. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about marketing okay. because this is, a, this is a big thing for a lot of people and a difficult thing for a lot of people. So what was your general strategy and, and what did you learn from, from the process so far in marketing this brand? First of all, I don't think you ever know what the strategy is. Like you, you set a strategy and you have an idea in your mind and it always never goes to plan. Um, especially with me, everything was so scattered and so go, 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 go. Because when you're a one person, like when you're doing everything yourself, it is so hard to nail everything. And so you kind of got to do what you got to do. And for me, you know, as a marketing person, I know what I need to do, but doing it is a different thing. And I think that number one, people need to realize that it's okay, um, like not to also beat themselves up about it because marketing is super hard. My strategy was to launch, have a website, a clean website. I think one of the most important things that you have like, is your website. It needs to be on point. It needs to communicate everything that it needs to communicate. And if you're going to spend any time, you need to spend you know, that time on your website. And it's not only pictures, it's also copy. Copy is super important, like understanding what messaging is going to be on the homepage? How are you going to structure your about us? Because your about us is not about the brand. It's about what the brand is going to do for your ideal customer. And that's the first thing you need. I think like no one really knows that because they'll go into like me, 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 me. And people, I always tell people like customers don't care about you. Right? I mean, that sounds really harsh, but they don't care. It's like, what is your brand going to do to help me fulfill my problem? I came to your website because I have an issue. How are you going to solve that issue? And your website should be littered with that. And then you have to understand, especially on your website, like what are the, what are the issues? So for swimwear, for example, 
it is really hard for someone to buy swimwear off of a website because they don't know sizing, they might have additional questions, shipping, et cetera, et cetera. So you also have to start thinking about these things. So I added a chatbot um, to help facilitate that process a little bit more. And I put in heat maps to understand where people are going to understand. And you need to, you need to spend a lot of time on your website. So that was like my number one. It was like, I really need to make it clean and look good and have all the information and really see what's going on with the website. And then I knew that because I'm a swimwear brand, and this is also understanding who your target audience is and where they're hanging out, that my the customer is going to be on Instagram. So I needed to be on Instagram. And so I launched my Instagram and I actually hired a graphic designer. Like one of the only people that I decided to hire was a graphic designer because I really wanted to be able to communicate my branding into my marketing. And I didn't think I could do that myself. And so I brought her in, brought her in. She's a, she did my logo, she did my color. So she kind of understood exactly what now in Rio kind of stood for. And she's still helping me today. And she's kind of a jack of, or a Jill of all trades. She does like video editing and she does animation, motion design, she does everything. She's absolutely amazing. And from there, I kind of said like, well, I need to do influencer marketing as well. And that was tricky because I have no budget. And I had to just start mass emailing people that were kind of talking to my customer uh, customer personas. So usually influencers that were into sustainable living or sustainable, sustainable fashion that were located in Sweden or Switzerland, which is where my target audience usually is located. And so I sent them samples. I asked them like, do you want to do a trade? The problem with trades is you never know what you're going to get because you can't say like, I need X, Y, and Z. You're just like, I'll just give this to you and you do what you want with it, you know, which can be great. I got this influencer that did a reel for me and like all these photos and one that just went and just ghosted me. So, I mean, that was very tricky. And then I did ads and ads were tricky as well because it's a lot of money that you're spending and you don't see the return very quickly because you're trying to warm up cold audiences and cold audiences will never purchase right away. So it's like getting them onto your website and then retargeting them and then trying to convert them. And I think there's like a stat out there that says like someone will see your ad seven times before they consider purchasing your, your item. So imagine if you're like spending 1,000 or 2,000 euros per month and you're getting like two or three sales, you kind of get a little bit of a panic attack and you're just like, oh my God, this isn't working. We need to stop. So I had that panic attack and I was like, you know what, I'm going to stop and I'm going to re rethink everything because this isn't, a mar- uh, this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. So I need to think long term. And I launched so quickly that I didn't have the ability to really structure everything because it was like a mad dash. And I did it because I thought that it would work. I just wanted to get it out there to see if it would work. And then I would structure it as I would go on. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And sometimes that's the way marketing has to be. I mean, we we try to get people thinking about marketing as early as possible, Uh, you know, as when they're building their brand. And then when they're building the strategy, they have to understand like how they're going to be reaching these people. Yeah. And the influencer stuff, you're right, it can be a hit or miss. You know, you can have people who are really great, who get you some new followers, some new exposure, but then, like you said, somebody can ghost you, you don't have much control over the content, so there's always pros and cons. If there are positions we specifically recommend people hire for, Facebook ads is definitely one of them, mm-hmm. because somebody has to have a deep understanding of those ads to understand, like, I'm going to test 20 ads a week you know, with slightly different creative or slightly different targeting. You know, there's all like, like a mad scientist, all this testing that goes into it uh, to make a successful campaign. And a lot of people don't really realize that going into it. So they put like, not, not what you did, but what some people do is they put like 20 bucks on an Instagram promotion and they're like, it's not working. Like, I mean, it also depends. I did hire an ads person and uh, she did run a lot of ads for me, but I think you need to also understand what you want and you need to understand how you hire people because what I ended up doing is when I launched, I thought I needed to hire a lot of people and I did. And I also needed to understand what my budget was and there was just a lot of confusion because I I got super excited that like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna launch, we're gonna like sell out immediately so I need to hire all these people on my team and then it was not that and I was like, oh no, wait. 
Uh, so I hired her and it was great, but like I think as well, she didn't do, for example, 20 different ads, you know, with little targeting and it was not there for me. And then I also hired a digital marketing person that was supposed to help me as well. And again, it wasn't there for me as well because they didn't really know what they were doing that much. And I didn't ask the right questions, I think, because I didn't have the the space to think about what I needed. I just hired because I knew I needed these things and I didn't take the time to be like, wait, well, you need to, that's the thing, when you hire someone, you need to provide them with something. You can't just expect them to go and start running in their own direction. And if you don't provide them with that information, they'll do whatever they think that they need to do and it's not necessarily the best thing for your brand. And I also learned that very quickly. <laughs> A really a sign of a really good freelancer, a good contractor, no matter what industry it is, is they'll ask you a lot of questions right away. Yeah. Is they will come to you and say, before we get started on anything, you know, and they have a whole list of questions about what you need, what you want, who your customer is, like what yeah. you know. So I think that's that's definitely important. But the problem nowadays is like everyone and their mother is like a graphic designer, a videographer, a social media manager, and like it's so hard to be able to weed throughout all these individuals because everyone says that they can do it. Everyone thinks that the, everyone is so great at convincing you that they know what they're doing, and they're like, "Yeah, for sure, I know how to do it." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you actually hire them and you start asking them questions, and they're just like, "Uh, what?" <laughs> I'm like, "Oh no." <laughs> I know we have a lot of students who before us have gone to like marketing gurus or drop shipping courses or things like that where they were promised the world and they get into the course and it's just it's just you know the freelancer doesn't know what they're doing or the guru has never actually done what they're trying to do yes. and so it's like how do you expect them to to help you then if they haven't done it themselves one of the things that I realize is that like I used to work in marketing but it's so different when you're launching your own business because it's such a different way of marketing and it's a different way of thinking about marketing. Because like when you work for an agency and you do social media, right? You just put on a post, it's so different than just strategy and implementation and understand there's so many pieces to the puzzle that you like, I feel like I'm a different marketer, completely different marketer now that I've launched a business than I was before. And when I see marketing gurus that have never launched a business or the way that they've gotten their money is because they have taught others, like I don't think that they understand what needs to be done to market a business. Yeah. And I think that that's the problem there. You need somebody who's been sympathetic to your struggles because it's true, when you're, when you're doing this yourself, it's really hard to get that 10,000 foot view because you're in the weeds every day. You know? yeah. You're know, you building your brand, you're tweaking your marketing, you're sourcing your content, you're talking to customers, you're doing a million things at once. So it's really hard to step back, even if it's something that you've done for years. Yeah. All of their advice that people give you is just so blanketed, like such an, a general advice. Like you should be on Instagram and do reels every day. And you're just like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> but. <laughs> Like but it. that's what everyone's saying now like if you're on Instagram they're like you should create a reel per day and that's how you're gonna explode your business and I'm like that can't no you can't say that it's not like a one-size-fits-all for everything and that's the problem it's like these gurus are throwing out these very blanketed statements like you should be doing reels every day or IGTVs or whatever it is but it depends on your market, it depends on your customer, it depends on where, like for example, I stopped doing TikToks because I, what I realized was TikToks are showing videos to like people within the same country. So for example, as, a, like, as someone who lives in Portugal, if I do TikToks, my videos will be pushed to people who have TikTok, who have a TikTok account in Portugal. But my customers are not Portuguese. So the point of me creating a TikTok, why? Because the people that are like watching my videos will not purchase from me. But if I was in the States, yeah. Or if, if the videos, I could somehow target, you know, all the videos. I mean, I could with, you know, ads and stuff and, you know. But organically, like I, it didn't make sense to me. And you have to take that in consideration. You can't just say like, everyone should have a TikTok account. No. False. <laughs> No. Yeah, it, it's very, it's very different. And there's so much, there's so much more nuance to it. It's like, okay, you could post one thing a day, but what, is, what is the thing that you're posting? Like, exactly. what is the content? Who is it targeted at? Like, there's so many other factors to consider. Um, so as we kind of wrap up now, just tell me, um, 
what are the things that if you were starting again tomorrow, what are the, the biggest things that you would do differently, the biggest things that you would do the same? So I think I would do most of the things the same. Um, I think that when you're building a business or recreating a business, everything is kind of learned by you, learn as you go. And a lot of people try to perfect their marketing or their website or their product or whatever, and it takes way too long before they actually launch. And I always say this now because I heard someone say this and they said, if you wait until you have the perfect product, you have launched too late. And I think that what I did was great. I think what I would do differently is just kind of check my expectations. Um, I was on Instagram, I was on TikTok, and I was seeing all of these small businesses blow up and saying how easy it is and how like amazing. And I just had this false sense of this kind of idea like, oh my gosh, I'm going to launch my brand. It's going to explode. I'm going to get so much money. I'm going to be six figures in like four months. It's so easy. And I launched and it wasn't like that. And what ended up happening was I started doubting a lot myself. I started thinking like my branding was wrong or my business, like everything was kind of wrong. And I started getting like really sad in that sense because I was like, oh my gosh, my brand isn't exploding. Why isn't it exploding? But what we're seeing here is that this narrative of like blowing up is false. Business is really hard. It takes three years to be profitable. You're not going to love your branding and your brand off the bat. It's going to change. I mean, look at any big brand, Nike, uh, Apple, Disney at the beginning. I'm pretty sure they weren't looking at their logos and being like, wow, this is an amazing logo. Um, and we should stop comparing ourselves as well to like big brands because a lot of people have a lot of money getting invested into their business. They are also maybe six or seven years ahead of you. Um, so just being realistic and understanding that. I think one of the things that I would do differently and what I'm going to try to do um, next year is to focus on two specific types of marketing. So there's the always on kind of marketing where you just post every day on, on Instagram and you make sure that you have information that's coming out all the time on your blog, on your Instagram. And then there's marketing campaigns. And I think it'd be super interesting to be able to create different types of marketing campaigns um, around products and see how those do and do maybe some ads and do something different than what's already out there. Because for example, in swimwear, everyone does the same thing. It's a woman that is like standing in front of a picture and it says recycled plastic and she's jumping in the water and like everyone's doing the same thing. So maybe a marketing campaign talking about, you know, like a Nike, like look, take experience, like a, a look at Nike, you know, the emotional aspect of it. Like I always cry every time I see those damn like Nike commercials. Because they, they, they don't talk about the product. They talk about the feeling that you get with, well, when you're wearing their products. And that's a marketing campaign. And it's short term, it's maybe a little bit more investment, uh, more ads, ad spend, and more time actually creating the, the photos and the videos. But maybe it'd be a little bit interesting to see how that would do. Um, and I think that's the direction that I would go um, in the future. And that's what I would like to do in the future. Very well said. <laughs> Very cool. Um, okay, before we end, anything else that you want to express or, or talk about with the brand? I mean, I think one of the things that I want everyone to understand, and I, uh, I have a podcast called the Branding Lab Podcast, so if anyone ever wants to like listen to, uh, listen to it, it's really great. And I was talking to another woman that has started a brand and uh, she's actually like seven or eight years into it now and I asked her like what her biggest piece of advice was and I loved it. Her name is like Christy Summer, she's, her brand is Encircled and she basically said, be kind to yourself. Um, you're not gonna, you know, you're gonna ship your product to the wrong person, something is gonna go wrong, Some, your website's gonna crash, you're not gonna be happy with your branding, like there's gonna be so many problems, but at the end of the day, you need to be kind to yourself because like I said, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and you will get there. As long as you're passionate about your product, you have understood your why, the why behind your business, which is like number one of branding, then it'll carry you through all of the dark times and it'll get you to where you want to go. And I think that's super important to remember. Truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> Amazing. Yvonne, thank you so much for being here and for, for telling uh, all of us about uh, this, this amazing journey. And we will be following very closely. We'll link to your podcast and your brand and everything. So Perfect. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everybody, if you uh, like this conversation, if you want to see more stuff like this, hit subscribe and the notification button so you don't miss any more of our future videos. And we'll see you next time.